Xbox On. Welcome to Xbox On, a podcast with one host about one console, Xbox. I'm said host, Jesse DeRosa, and on today's episode, we'll be talking about the latest Xbox news for the week of June 23rd, 2022, including, we got word on a canceled Tony Hawk remake collection, Xbox finally gets another Final Fantasy, although it's probably not the one you're hoping for, a new multiplayer shooter is on the way from an unexpected developer, and more. Welcome to episode 160 of the Xbox On Podcast. In this week in Xbox News, Batman Arkham Knight was released on the Xbox One in the year 2015, so I think it's the first time I've done that segment or that little opening with it actually being a notable release that people care about, but hey, episode 160 is the first normal release Xbox On episode in a couple of weeks. We had a delay for the Summer Game Fest, then we had an early episode for the Xbox presentation, and then we had a bonus episode. Now, just back to the regular role, and boy, does the Newsweek reflect it, because uh, this is definitely that post-E3 lull. But hey, we're not going to let that get us down, because on Xbox On, we always find some bullshit to harp on. So, guys, how are you doing tonight? Let's take it slow. How's everybody doing? We uh, That's that's usually the line that like dro- makes listenership drop off 60% at the top of the show so actually let's not do that i don't care how you're doing i'll ask you at the end of the show let's get right into it guys let's open with some stories of mild amusement this week you 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 know i would like to make a a point to say last week was a minor hiccup with activision because we got a little bit of update on the harassment stuff all the lawsuit stuff all the prejudice stuff and uh this week we're back to our streak of no Activision update, so no bad news to relay. In fact, we're going to deviate from Activision and go straight to their biggest competitor, EA Games, and talk about them for a second. Because one of their developers, arguably their biggest developer, but are also arguably no longer their most important developer because Respawn exists. But developer DICE said some stupid shit that I got to talk about. So as relayed from VGC, guys, DICE's new general manager has said that the studio has no time to surprise non-Battlefield projects as it looks to establish itself as a as a leading developer in the FPS market. While the studio is primarily working on Battlefield franchise for the most uh, for most of the past 20 years, it occasionally developed other games too, including Star Wars Battlefront series and of course my beloved Mirror's Edge. I would say that's easily their best game they've ever made. In one of her first interviews since joining the company last November, in an interview with GamesIndustry.biz, Rebecca Codes was asked if working on projects in the vein of Mirror's Edge was currently off the table, to which she responded, totally. We are focused on Battlefield 2042. There's no time for anything else. That is what we want to do. In three years, we want to be the first person shooter powerhouse that DICE deserves to be. And that is what we're going for. So I, I don't know if that's a, I don't think that should be a surprise to absolutely anybody, but just to see Mirror's Edge get name dropped in, you know, in, in now of all times, you know, a game that was so niche and so obscure, but also so standout for its time back in 08 when it came out, you know, in such a underappreciated kind of niche, I would say cult following of a cult classic of a game. And then eventually it got its sequel with Mirror's Edge Catalyst in 2016, early 2016, which ended up being, you know, I don't think I was as down on that game as other people were. It was significantly worse in the first game, but it certainly wasn't the proper follow-up we'd been hoping for. And then, you know, after that, it's just like, this this game's dead. So I'm not surprised to see, in particular, Mirror's Edge is absolutely off the table. But also, this makes sense. I, I think DICE has got to feel the pressure right now, because, if coming from all sides, right? Because it's like, you fucked up with Star Wars Battlefront 2 at launch so badly that the Walt Disney Company was pissed at you. And that put a lot of bad bad press on you guys. Obviously, you know, they turned that game around over time, but that that's not what matters. What matters is that initial impression. They fucked it up. And then they fucked it up again the following year with Battlefield 5, which everyone fucking hated, following Battlefield 1, which everyone loved. And so they screwed up with that game as well. And so Battlefield 2043 was like their opportunity to like kind of reset and get back to 
get back to basics for them because it really was just like, hey, we haven't had modern warfare battlefield for a while. You know, we've had we done World War One, we did World War Two, we did a whole bunch of Star Wars Battlefront. Like, let's get back to like modern warfare battlefield. I think that will really get people hyped. And Battlefield 2042 looked promising. They announced all the right news. They said all the right things. That portal mode's fucking awesome. And then they just fucked up that launch too and they fucked up the PR around it. They went ahead and blamed Halo for some of the game's mistakes and things like that. They just really screwed the fuck out of it. And uh I don't know, now now they're in a weird spot because they screwed up with Battlefield. They screwed up with Battlefront. They they look significantly weaker to the competition when you compare like what 343 just put out with Halo Infinite, which by no means is not a game free of any issues. Like Halo Infinite has miles and miles of work ahead of it. And still, it's like, by comparison, Halo Infinite looks significantly better. And then you look at their biggest competitor, Call of Duty, and say what you fucking will. Call of Duty never launches completely and utterly broken and fucked. There are some Call of Duty games that launch with some issues, but Call of Duty never launches completely fucked and broken. Even, even though it's fun to hate on Vanguard, Vanguard launch is a very playable, mostly complete package worth $60. And the same just can't be said about a lot of DICE's more recent releases. So it makes sense that this is, you know, is something they want to double down focus on. is just like kind of salvaging their name and getting back to the reputation they once held back in their prime years with like Battlefield 2 and then into the Bad Company days and even into like Battlefield 3 and 4. Uh, they've completely lost that kind of respect and that just level of like mystique and like in in respect people had from where they're just like oh they're one of those high quality developers i feel like battlefield was always kind of viewed as like you want to play like grown-up call of duty you want to play call of duty for people who have to like kind of think and be a little more tactical something that's a little more fully fleshed out and developed and a little more realistic a little more you know to the next level battlefield kind of that was like its marketing angle especially against call of duty as it became you know more and more in competition with that franchise but then they just like they i don't know they just fucked it up so bad and I, I gotta say if it weren't for the fact that ea cannot afford to shutter any more studios because of all the flack they took for shuttering all the best studios you know with uh a couple of years back then uh I, I think dice may not may not have been a safe a safe bet you know that they'd, they'd be sticking around but the fact that EA isn't really in that position to do that anymore. I feel like they kind of have to keep dice around. And, uh, you know, now they've, they definitely no doubt been de demoted to second place when you compare them to what is undoubtedly the best talent that EA has under their belt over at Respawn. Titanfall, you know, they might not have been the, the best selling FPS games of all time. Easily some of the most innovative, fun, and excellently crafted and developed FPS games of the past, you know, I'd say 20 years. Apex Legends, the only Battle Royale to make people who hate Battle Royale games like Battle Royale. You know, that game makes insane money. It's insanely well-received. It's pretty much always had a pretty good reputation surrounding it. It's, uh, you know, the, those are the guys to beat over on Team EA. And they've definitely kind of shaken up the status quo at DICE and, and given them a run for their money. So... I, I like that personally, you know, back in my Nintendo fanboy days, I always kind of resented DICE because of those comments they used to always make, ri ripping on Nintendo for being underpowered and for babies and shit. I'll never forget that time they had to retract a statement because they were like, I don't know, they, it was like around the time the Wii U came out, they were like laughing because um, they said that, that, like, Ninten that they'll never release a Battlefield game on Nintendo hardware because Nintendo will never release a, a piece of hardware that can handle their high fidelity beautiful fps games and even though that is kind of true it's like fuck you <laughs> nintendo makes way better games than uh than you do dice so sad as the kids would say and uh no i mean obviously you know there's a lot of pretty good people i'm sure that work at dice and you don't want to see them all struggle and have their their careers in jeopardy but th this studio has certainly fallen from grace and so to see that they're doubling tripling down focusing really hard on battlefield and trying to revive their reputation and that franchise's reputation seems like really the only opportunity the only choice they have but dude like i just they had they had such a fucking easy win ahead of them with battlefield 2043 like nobody wanted to like call of duty vanguard and battlefield 2043 2042 like looked like a very good uh, like uh, battlefield game and it and it was different enough in terms of what it was and its setting and its approach to halo to where you could have both of these things exist last fall. There could have been 
a, a timeline where both Halo Infinite and Battlefield 2042 both launched and were excellent first-person shooters of different varieties in different respects, and uh, that just wasn't the case. Instead, we got modern gaming where everything was at least a little bit broken. Call of Duty had shit zombies. Halo was uh, 45% developed, and Battlefield 2042 is just an absolute buggy mess. So, unfortunately, that's what we ended up getting instead, but... You know, we'll see. We'll see what happens with Dice. I just wanted to read that statement. Um, actually, the main reason I wanted to read this statement was just out of love and respect for my what my favorite Dice game of all time, which is Mirror's Edge. Um, but uh, we're we're never gonna see that franchise again, I don't think. <laughs> all right, next up, we got another story of mild amusement. Something we gotta talk about, guys. Speaking of Halo Infinite, a little bit of leaked footage of the upcoming Forge mode um, surfaced this week. VGC reports that. Forge, the mode that allows players to cust make custom modes and games uh, using a suite of tools and scripting options, is due out at the end of this year as a free update after it was delayed from the game's launch back, you know, when it was supposed to launch apparently in 2020 or whatever the hell that was about. The latest footage was t uh, s was actually published on Twitter by Twitter user Rebs Gaming, who showed flexibility in Forge offering modding of infinite weapons, which is a new thing we have not yet seen in a prior forge um, suite so using the tools of this new forge mode it looks like players will be able to transplant uh one weapon's effects onto another such as by making the cinder shot fire rockets or having a gravity hammer hit like an energy sword uh, another segment of gameplay the footage even shows weapons functioning like a gravity gun from half-life 2 literally being able to like click on objects and pick them up and move them around and shit and throw them Forge has been in closed testing with a small group of community creators since earlier this year and is planned for a Season 3 launch and Season 3 of Halo Infinite is tentatively scheduled for end of year, probably November-ish. Uh, but with the extension of Season 1 having lasted over six months, by the time Season 2 arrived, of course, you know, it could be quite a while before we get this. So it's too bad because by all accounts, it looks like Forge is absolutely everything this game needs to inject the proper amount of life back into it. And they just can't get it out the door fast enough. It's really, it's really quite unfortunate. Obviously, they got to get this right when they do launch it. So if it needs time, it needs time. That's all there is to it. But it's just too unfortunate that this couldn't have been, I guess, a bigger focus or, or maybe I don't know. Maybe that's how you want to put it. Earlier in development, um, when when you know they had to make those tough decisions as uh, as like what is going to be that day one launch content? What are we going to come out the gate with? Obviously, we're going to have to cut some things off, bring some things in later. Obviously, they cut out a decent amount of multiplayer maps. They cut I'm not saying that they had them and then didn't put them in, but rather that they just, they had to make the decision to launch with like a bare bones multiplayer suite. They had to make the decision to launch without co-op campaign, without being able to fucking revisit other levels you've already played in the campaign. They had to cut a lot of fucking things out for day one. It's just, man, if they just, ah, if they somehow could have had this be a part of that, or at least be something that launched later in season one. I think we'd be, we'd be singing a very different tune about Halo Infinite, which is quite disappointing because, again, people are hyped about Forge. It looks like from what we've been getting from leaks over the past handful of months, it seems like at this point, it's just so, so much stuff that people want to see and want to have access to, and will inject so much community, so much life, so much humor, so much entertainment into this game, so... We'll wait, because what other choice do we have? Halo is life. All right, one more story of mild amusement I want to go through before we get into the actual news this week. Guys, this is a... Uh, I saw a couple outlets talking about this, and I think this is really interesting. I don't know... I guess I guess a lot of people miss this. I, I absolutely miss this, but... The Quarry recently released the the uh, Quantic... Not, not Quantic, Supermassive Games developed uh, horror game, The Quarry, and the upcoming FPS game for Xbox, High on Life... Uh, both of which were originally designed or intended to be Google Stadia games, if you remember Google Stadia. According to Axios, the uh, sources speaking with the publication, both titles were at one point uh, at one point signed with Google before its decision to downsize its internal games business meant that these titles were forced to find other publishers. Supermassive Games was looking for publisher partners uh, as the project came to completion, a rep from Take Two uh, told Axios. Another person from High Life, High on Life Development Squash declined to offer comment beyond the game's targeted platforms. Google announced it had signed an unannounced game from Until Dawn developer Supermassive back in July of 2020, but the game was never shown. So obviously we can connect the dots and see that that was this. Last year, Google decided to close all of its internal game development teams and 
at Stadia in order to focus on partnering with third-party studios. And of course, like most things Google does, Stadia is just this now decrepit, dying on its last leg service that no one gives a shit about. Even though, it, you know, by mo most people's accounts who actually use it, it was actually a pretty good service. So for what it's worth, rip Google Stadia. So I think, I just thought that was really interesting um, because I know a lot of people um, who play the quarry say it's a little less gameplay focused than um, games like Until Dawn, Supermassive's first game of this nature was a lot more gameplay focused by comparison. And I don't know, I, I, heard, I saw and heard takes of like, hey, you know, maybe this was an intentional thing considering that this game was designed with Stadia in mind and it made it a more streamable and enjoyable game from that perspective. But of course, when you then take that and then make it home to Xbox and PlayStation and all that, it maybe falls apart a little more in the messaging. I, I don't really know because I can't speak to this. I haven't played the Quarry yet. But I just thought that was really interesting to think about how with, uh, with the Quarry coming out and having been pretty well respected, all things considered, despite maybe being a little high in the price range, um, and then, of course, high on life, being really well received from its, um, its reveal and a seemingly pretty highly anticipated Xbox style this fall. It, it just sucks to see on Google's behalf. It looks like they had two hits on their hands, or at least seemingly so. And of course they just let all that go because you know, poor Google probably doesn't have the money to afford to uh, properly run a gaming division for a long enough time to give it a, a chance to breathe and live. So it's, it's so funny the way Google handled Stadio when you think about it. It's like so many of these stories with kinds of projects of like, we're starting our own service, we're starting our own platform, we're starting our own foray into this ecosystem it has to do a lot with like early years of trials and tribulations and struggling and getting people to take you serious and believe you're legitimate and uh google microsoft does this a lot with other services so not to not give them blame where, where necessary it's just so funny how google time and time again have done this um this this game of like here we'll throw a bunch of money we'll hire a bunch of talent we'll throw all the everything there is at this one project uh and then if it doesn't immediately become a roaring success we will just fucking abandon it and let it die a slow and painful death and that's exactly what we're seeing with stadia there was never at any point any attempt to course correct or to wait it out or to just continue to believe and invest in it it was just like here's a bunch of fucking money what do you mean it didn't take off in 10 minutes okay bye you know this is like when amazon did a fucking smartphone all over again <laughs> But anyway, I just thought that was an interesting story of mild amusement, thus, uh, therefore, why it was in that section of the show. But with that out of the way, guys, I think we should move into some more proper Xbox-related news. What do you guys say? So before we actually do that, I would like to tell you real quick about the games I've been playing this week. But of course, before I can tell you about the games I've been playing and the news after that, I've got to first tell you real quick about what I've been eating. But I can't just tell you about what I've been eating because, unfortunately, this week... The thing I want to be eating is the thing I cannot be eating. So guys, take a seat, listen up, tell your kids to shut up for a second, okay? They're being loud and obnoxious and, and you don't want to hear them. I got to tell you guys about a sad, sad story. The story of, or what I refer to as, Aldi in the case of the Mickey, missing mac and cheese pizza. So Aldi, you know, grocery store, German grocery store chain, all about, you know, cheap knockoff brands of other name brand foods and good prices and whatnot basically the poor people's version of trader joe's which is their more upscale brand aldi introduced a mac and cheese pizza a couple weeks back and my girlfriend who's a big big fan of aldi was like oh people on the aldi subreddit are saying really good things about this mac and cheese pizza and so we were there we were grocery shopping i was like fuck it i'm trying it if it's anything, if it if this tastes the way I remember the mac and cheese pizza from CC's Pizza tasting when I was a kid, then I will be happy. Now, of course, as an adult, the CC's Pizza mac and cheese probably mac and cheese pizza probably sucks ass. But again, let me let me remember things the way they were. So I'm just you know, it's tempering my expectations, but hoping that against the odds, this is quite good. And we bring it home, we pop it in the oven, and I don't know what to expect. But guys, this. This mac and cheese pizza literally tastes exactly like what an adult version of the CC's mac and cheese pizza should be. It is a thinner, crispier crust, but not too thin and crispy to where it's a cracker. It still has a good chew to it. It still has some decent flavor. It's not a dry, salted cracker. The The mac and cheese is, is present, but not 
too much over the top. It's not like a bowl of mac and cheese on a pizza. It's like a piece of pizza with mac and cheese on it. The cheesy sauce on there is very nice. They don't overboard it. Again, the proportions are very tasteful. They go light on the cheese, light on the sauce. Very nice. And this pizza is, uh, simply put, phenomenal. In, t in fact, I, I baked it with the intention of having two or three slices and then saving the rest for later. But what I actually did was I ate all but one slice. It was that good. And the only reason why I didn't finish it was because I knew I'd be sad if I didn't have some later. So I saved the piece. But not all stories can end happily like that. It's not that I just went back to, to um, Aldi within the next week and bought another mac and cheese pizza. No, because unfortunately God had other plans and his plans included getting rid of the mac and cheese pizza. You see, Aldi likes to change up some of their specialty items on a very, very regular basis. And this just happened to be one of those items. It was a, hey, it's here for a week or two, then fuck off and move on with your life. And unfortunately... I was too late. By the next time we had gone to Aldi, the mac and cheese pizza was nowhere to be found. In fact, we tried two other Aldi locations within a few days of that that discovery, and it was still nowhere to be found. So it's safe to say the mac and cheese pizza is now gone, and all we're left with are the memories. So this isn't what I've been eating. This is what I wish I were eating. This is what I once ate. This is a in memoriam, uh, I guess, to the, um, to the mac and cheese pizza. Aldi, if you're wise, you'll bring it back. Now that's it for what I've wish. I, I've been eating. Now let's talk about what I'm playing. Guys, I ha I'm so excited to finally be able to tell you that this week I finally finished Far Cry 6. Yes, God Almighty, it's done. It has been deleted from my hard drive. The credits have been rolled. The final achievement's been unlocked. And that bitch is no longer on my hard drive. It's see that 92 gigs come back. It feels so satisfying. I'm a happy boy right now. Far Cry 6 has been a very good game. Um, I'm, I'm surprised to say it, honestly, because Far Cry 5 was such a letdown to me, and I feel like Far Cry 6 basically fixed seemingly all my problems with Far Cry 5, or at least the big ones. You know, they give you, they give you an original character again, you know, you can choose a female or a male version of your character at the start, but either way, this is a character with a name, an identity, voice acting, a prominent role within the story. It's like an actual character. So it's not like that Far Cry 5 bullshit where you get to customize your own unique identity character and you get to dress them the way you want so that you can feel represented in the game. It's like, no, no, no. It's not that bullshit where it's like, here's a big fat inclusivity excuse so that we don't have to develop a character for you. It's like they gave you an actual fucking character. I, I picked the guy. His name is Danny. He's, he's fine. He's not the best protagonist, but he's much, much better than no protagonist at all. So they fixed that. They also fixed the issue with Far Cry 5 where you have to, like, destroy every little square inch of a corner of the map in order to come across a single boss in order to move on to the next part of the map. It felt very limiting and very obnoxious and collect-a-thon for a open-world, do-it-yourself kind of game. This game brings it back to, a uh, hey... Play the game in whatever order you want, however you want. You just have to beat all the main missions in order to progress to the end. So I feel like they fixed that. Um, and also the game just feels... It feels like a spiritual successor, a spiritual sequel to Far Cry 3 in a lot of ways. You can tell with the setting they chose, with the way they decided to represent a lot of things in this game. It just feels very much like it's trying to recapture that magic of Far Cry 3. And while I don't think you can recapture that magic with the same exact gameplay formula, they, and I don't think they do it successfully here, I think what we got was a very good Far Cry game. The villain's really cool. Um, he's a lot more prominent and present than villains typically have been in Far Cry games. I know it's always been a huge criticism, uh, not just of mine, but of most people's, that Far Cry always builds really cool villains, and then they kind of fuck off for large chunks of time. Don't get me wrong, that happens in this game, but it happens a lot less than it does in like Far Cry 5 in particular. 5 had a really interesting villain and then that villain ends up being so milk toast, um, just due to lack of having a prominent role and just a really lame ending and just all these things, I, I don't, whatever. But um, I, I will say Far Cry 6, very interesting premise. I, I really love the whole like, this like, it's like this alternate reality Cuba basically that basically has the cure to cancer with this crop that they grow on their island that's kind of native to their land in this like world power play that this dictator has where it's like he could potentially sell the cure to cancer, but he kind of holds it for himself in an attempt to kind of have this, this, this reign of power and 
have a place on the world stage. It's, it's very sadistic. It's very cool. I think a lot of times the game falls flat in terms of trying to really take that amazingly cool concept and really bring it forward with some really interesting ideas and, and developments. I think it falls flat a little bit in trying to do that. But nonetheless, the idea is really cool. The acting is really cool. And there are definitely some very, very far cry moments. You know, moments where it's like, ah, oh, fuck, that's, that's badass for the villain to do that. Or like, ah, oh, man, that's like kind of terrifying that that happens so it definitely has those moments and i uh, I, I found it to be just a really enjoyable time definitely longer than i would like to as someone who just likes to play through the main story and tell the rest of the game to fuck off I, I think these games are a little long in the tooth i think with every far cry game that's the case even my favorite far cry game where you could you could probably cut out 30 percent of the missions and you would have a tighter game as a result of it because there's just too many missions where it's like I get it. You want to break up all the gunfights and things like that with like a mission that develops more of the characters, but it's like, I don't want to play a 30 minute mission where I have to swim to an island with my friends and then go fishing and capture the fish and discover the grill and put it all together and grab fireworks so we can set up for a big party on the beach. It's like, I don't, you can just condense that into a cutscene. I really don't need to play that 30 minute mission of gathering all the fish, and gathering all the, the tinder rather, not, not tender, tender's money. You don't want to burn that shit. But anyway, nonetheless, I, I think overall, if you are a Far Cry fan, Far Cry 6 is a very solid entry. Um, it definitely has its issues. It's not a perfect game. Um, but at the same time, if you are someone who's played a Far Cry game, but you're not necessarily like a diehard Far Cry fan, you're like, oh, I played one or two of them. They're pretty good. I would say maybe don't play Far Cry 6 or maybe just wait a very long time to play it because even though I like Far Cry a lot, I, I really felt at the end of this one, I'm like, you know what? After playing extensively Far Cry 3, 4, New Dawn, 5, and now 6, uh, I never did play Primal. I just feel very fatigued from this franchise and I feel like if they were to announce, you know, if they were to release a Far Cry 7 in like two years from now, I would almost definitely just be like, I'm good. Unless it's like fucking like yakuza like japanese mafia style far cry taking place in like tokyo concrete jungle shit um, unless they can somehow like do that kind of setting I i'm probably not going back to far cry at least for a very long time but at the same time i don't regret having played far cry 6 it's kind of a, a weird way to feel about a game but that's the main thing i've been playing um actually today or i guess today is wednesday that i'm recording this but thursday is when it goes live so the day this episode goes live sonic origins will officially be out so i have that pre-ordered downloaded on my xbox ready to go unfortunately i'm going to be out of town until monday so i'm, I'm not going to get to play it for a while but um i am very much looking forward to getting into sonic origins replaying you know the original few sonic games one two three and knuckles and cd you know, as we kind of wait in anticipation for Sonic Frontiers this fall. I mean, I feel like it's kind of a steep ask for $40 for what, what this game has, but it also does have enough new to where, as a Sonic fan, I feel comfortable enough pulling the trigger, but I don't know. I don't have huge expectations I'm going to be wowed in this product. It's, I mean, again, it's the same basic Sonic, original Sonic games that we've played a million times before. At least I know I have. I've beaten Sonic the Hedgehog 2 and Sonic CD enough times to where like I, I basically throw up at the thought of them but here we are bottom again so i'm looking forward to getting into those again next weekend but guys that's it for what i've been playing that's it for what i've been eating that's it for our mild amusement stories and now i think it's time we get into our proper news of the week what you want more news okay here we go we got a whole new segment to go through starting with some sad news we got some sad news at the top about ea being like no more Mirror's Edge. Now we're going back to Activision. And Activision's like, no more Tony Hawk, okay? No more... What is Tony? Anthony. No more Anthony Hawk for you. So VGC relaying the sad, sad news. Reads, a planned remake of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3 and 4 was canned due to Activision Blizzard's decision to absorb developer Vicarious Visions. That's according to a pro, the Pro Skater himself, who claimed during a live stream on Monday this past Monday, that Activision had briefly taken pitches from other studios, but allegedly wasn't happy with any of them. Quote, that's what the plan was up until the release of 1 and 2, Tony Hawk said. We were doing 3 and 4, and then Vicarious Visions kind of got absorbed, and they were looking at they, and they were looking for other developers, and then it was over. The truth of it is that Activision were trying to find somebody to do 3 and 4, but they just didn't really trust anyone the way they did Vicarious. 
So they took all their pitches from other studios and were like, what would you do with Tony Hawk's Pro Skater? And they didn't like anything they heard, and that was it. Who knows, maybe when the dust settles, we'll figure it out. You never know. I would have never thought that they were going to do a 1 in 2 remake after 20 years. End quote. Activision Blizzard announced in January 2021 that they planned to fold Vicarious Visions into Blizzard as a support team, and the merger became official in April of this past year because God hates us all. At the time, Activision Blizzard said that Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2 and Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy developer would no longer be creating games at the as a lead studio. Going forward, Vicarious Vision's team of around 200 people will be employees of Blizzard and, quote, fully dedicated to existing Blizzard games and initiatives, Activision Blizzard said. The veteran studio who formed over 30 years and has worked on dozens of titles, including Skylanders, Guitar Hero, Destiny, and Call of Duty. Okay, that, those are some great nods, but I just want to do this real quick, just because I know that you guys used to hate Activision a few months ago before Xbox agreed to buy them. And now that Xbox is like, oh, we'll buy them because money. I know now it's like really not cool to hate on Activision because we got to protect green at all costs. But I want to just do, you know, as someone who was someone born in the 90s who grew up in, you know, that late 90s, early 2000s time period as a gamer since I was like five years fucking old. I just want to I just want to say a couple video game titles and see if that makes you want to, I don't know, become a fucking serial killer or not. So let, just, just hang on tight. Spider-Man. And I'm not talking about the 2018 Spider-Man. I'm talking about the PlayStation 1, N64, never soft developed Spider-Man. They co-developed that or they worked on, I forget which version they worked on, but they worked on that game. Spider-Man 2, Enter Electro. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2, Star Wars Jedi Knight 2, Jedi Outcast, Jet Set Radio for Game Boy Advance, Disney's Extreme Skate Adventures for Game Boy Advance, Tony Hawk's Underground, SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom, God damn it, I can't speak, Shrek 2, Shark Tale, Tony Hawk's Underground 1 and 2, Spider-Man 2 for Nintendo DS and PSP, they worked on Doom 3 on Xbox, X-Men Legends, or maybe they just did the second Xbox Legend or X-Men Legends, Ultimate Spider-Man, Tony Hawk's American Skate Land, Marvel Ultimate Alliance, Spider-Man 3, Guitar Hero 3, Tony Hawk's Proven Ground, Kung Fu Panda, 007 Quantum of Solace, Guitar Hero World Tour, Transformers, Revenge of the Fallen, Skylanders, Destiny 2, Crash Bandicoot, Insane Trilogy. So some of those were co-developed or they did certain versions of it because they worked on a lot of games with Neversoft, which was kind of like their, their counterpart at Activision. So not all of those were like 100% uh, Vicarious Visions, but there's a couple of titles for you. And I just want to say like, Half of those games are so much better. So I don't, I don't give a shit how much slack I take. I, like, this is the nice thing about having an Xbox podcast where it's like, it's my show. I'm not beholden to anyone. It's like, who fucking cares? 20 people listen to the show. I'll say what I want. This is the nice thing about having this kind of show is I get to, this is where I get to be as wrong as possible and feel right about it. When I say Blizzard sucks ass compared to like the games that Vicarious Visions and Neversoft used to make. I know, people love Diablo 2, people love Warcraft 3, people love World of Warcraft, people love Overwatch because for some fucking reason you're all a bunch of sexual deviants. But here's the real truth. These old Spider-Man games, these old Tony Hawk games, these old Guitar Hero games, Blizzard doesn't hold a candle. And I know that's incredibly subjective and probably in the eyes of hardcore gamers not true because hardcore gamers only like games that are gritty, realistic, very violent, very bloody, and if a game has any resemblance of cartooniness to it, it's like, oh god, that's a, that's a game, that's, that's not a real game. So, mm, and rant. But it just fucking boils my blood to think about how Activision used to run the gamut to some extent. They're like, we got Call of Duty, we got kids games, we got fucking Blizzard for people who like to not wear pants in their homes. We got it all. We got it all over here. And over the years, it's just been like, no, no, no. We got Call of Duty and we got Overwatch porn. Pick your fucking poison. And that's all you get these days. And now, Vicarious Vision is technically referred to as Blizzard Albany. Gross. Fucking kill me. So now instead of making cool Spider-Man games or Guitar Hero games or Crash Bandicoot or whatever the fuck, Tony Hawk games, they get to work on y'all's favorite fucking games like Diablo Immortal, Overwatch 2. So, gross. I don't know. This just, this just makes me sick to know it's like Activision were smart enough to recognize the fact that they didn't have anyone who could make a Tony Hawk game as well as Vicarious Visions, but still felt like that Tony Hawk, the, the, having Tony Hawk in your stable of games was not important enough that they couldn't just take Vicarious Visions and cram them on into Blizzard and be like, fuck you, go support some Diablo project. It'll make money. Microtransactions. So that's the reality of the situation. That's the world we live in. And I want to let you know, every time you buy a microtransaction, Diablo Immortal, every time you talk about how you're excited for Diablo 4, and most importantly, every time you get under your bed sheets at night, 
turn on a flashlight, and jerk yourself off to the fucking penguin girl from Overwatch, you are contributing to the downfall of modern society. You are everything that's wrong with this world, and Xbox shouldn't acquire Activision. They should acquire the decency to hogtie Bobby Kotick and make him recite demonic phrases while they do that thing from... Man, what movie What movie was that where they, where they put the rat on the guy and then they cover the rat over the guy's chest and then they took the butane torch to the to the box where the rat is and the rat freaks out and starts biting through the guy was that what what movie was that was that, was that a batman movie i don't fucking remember but that's what they should do maybe that was a, maybe that was an excellent movie i don't remember but that's what they should do it's a little violent but uh i have nothing else to say other than like i i all joking aside i, th I think activision is going to find themselves in a bit of an issue if the, if this continues if this whole blindsided short-sighted short-term approach to like what's popular now continues to operate the country instead of or the company instead of how can we diversify our catalog because i think having tony hawk even if it's you know a moderate success by comparison of something like warcraft or diablo is a lot more valuable than just having diablo just having call of duty because then when those games don't hit i don't know man sure it'd be nice to have more than one thing but anyway that was a pretty poorly stated analysis of the story just it makes me sad because my childhood is over i think i'm i think i'm a little bent out of shape right now because i watched that new um light year movie this past weekend and i thought it was actually really good i it, that if that movie that movie has two support characters that absolutely suck and if it weren't for those two support characters that i hate I would say that's one of my favorite Pixar movies of all time because it's just very fun and uh, it just reminds me of like the shit I used to like as a kid and I and I I spent this this entire week just saying like if this were 2007 or 2003 or even 1999 there would be a licensed movie tying game for this game so fast it'd make your head spin and it would be fun as shit and every gaming outlet would give it like a five out of ten but I don't care I'd still buy it and have a good time but we live in this world where there is a strict ban on games with comic mischief or cartoon violence or a cartoon spin or anything childish or fun or lighthearted. Everything has to be serious. The fact that I walked out of a movie theater today or this week after seeing Lightyear and we're like, man, I sure would like to hop in a fun, you know, eight hour level based action third person shooting platforming game where you play as like a spaceman maybe you get to do some space combat maybe you get to do some light combat some blasters and alien robots and you know whatever you know eight hours and you're done and you're moving on with your life the fact that that kind of concept of a game is damn near impossible to find in the year 2022 because my only options for sci-fi games are like okay there's two billion planets to explore and you customize your own spaceship and trust me man once you get to the 47 hour mark the game really starts to starts to settle in that's when it gets really good and you get to create your own character of course i made mine look like channing tatum without a scrotum and you get to do all this really awesome exploration stuff blah 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 blah, blah. it's like damn dude I get it. Everything has to be like big, explorative, quadruple A, realistic and gritty and violent. It has to make all the guys who say they're too old to go to Chuck E. Cheese go like have their balls drop. I get it. I get it. That's the only thing we're allowed to have now. It's got to be super cool, super badass. But I see this story about Vicarious Visions and it's the same fucking story. It's like we can't have the fucking awesome like skater guy video game where it's like a, basically a rhythm game mixed with an arcade game mixed with a sports title and it's action based and it's fucking fun and it's fast and you collect this shit and there's not too much to the game. It's kind of beauty and it's simplicity and you can just play it for hours and hours and hours just getting good at it and just having fun with your friends. It's got a killer soundtrack. It oozes like 90s and early 2000s pop culture and it's just a good time. There's no catch. You don't have to fucking buy a season pass and play for three years to figure out the what makes it so special. You pick up the game, you have a good time, you continue on with your life, rinse, repeat until you die. That's not an option anymore. And seeing the likes of Vicarious Visions be pulled away from these opportunities 
and lumped into you got to work on Diablo 4 because it's going to be an open world Diablo game that's going to be a live games as a service. People are going to be mind blown because, dude, literally fucking Rod Ferguson himself said this at the Xbox showcase. And yes, I said it as a pro when we talked about it last week, and I'm saying it as a con now because it's both. It's a double edged sword. It's cool to have these games, but we don't need everything to be this game. And that is when he said the game really picks up when you get into the post game. When you, once you get into the uh, the post campaign or right, whatever the fucking term he used was. But this notion that's like, yay, I, I finally beat 35 hours of the main game. Now the game's really going to pick off, pick up and take off. It's like, dude, I stop, stop. I get it. A lot of people play Destiny in 2014 and we're like, this is different. But that doesn't mean we all have to do Destiny meets Fallout meets Far Cry. I get, fu fuck off, man. I've been beating this drum for as long as I've been doing this podcast, and I've been frustrated about it even be since before I had this podcast, and I will be frustrated with it until the fucking cows come home, if, if, that's, how the, if that's how the saying goes. It just breaks my heart that there's no room in the industry anymore for just casual fun games. And I understand that a huge portion of this is like, well, Jesse, you got to understand games are really expensive to make. And the scene is so competitive in the AAA space. They, there's no room for like moderate successes or like games that just sell 8 million copies. It's like, everything's got to be the game that's constantly in the news cycle. The game that's constantly surviving and keeping people's interest long after it's released. I get that, but also fuck that, you know, like absolutely fuck that. It makes, it makes me sad. And then you could say, but Jesse, there is room for those fun comic mischief, cartoon, E for everyone, whatever kind of games. Games that only take four hours, games that only take seven hours, whatever. Anything you want like that, those games exist in the indie space. No, that's not true because the indie space is constantly pretending that we haven't surpassed the technological capabilities of the Super Nintendo. And don't get me wrong, this isn't a slight against AAA or indie. I, I, I love these... I love the genres we're exploring currently in both spaces, and I love a lot of games we're getting from both spaces, but I'm constantly being driven mad, feeling like I'm stuck in this time period where it's like, do we not have space for just a fucking casual game? You know who's like the only, one of the developers I'm constantly praising on this podcast, one of the only developers that still has the ability to make a game like this? Insomniac. Insomniac, you look at, look at the new Ratchet and Clank game. That game's probably like 10 to 12 hours long, it's basically level or mission based in a more modern sense, but whatever. And it's just a fun fucking game. Yes, you can stick around and collect all the shit and get all the trophies if you want, but you just play the game, you enjoy the game, you move on with your life. You don't have to fucking sign a prenup when you download the game in case you become distracted by another game down the road and have to figure out who gets to keep the children. And I love that concept. What a novel concept. But no, Vicarious Visions is cuck sucking on the fucking Overwatch 2 and Diablo 4. Good for you guys. I understand in the grand scheme of things, Overwatch 2, Diablo 4, these games will be infinitely more successful than any Tony Hawk game ever. These games will sell millions and millions of copies. These games will make a bit, or in the case of uh, Overwatch 2, because it's free to play, will make billions and billions of dollars off of stupid cosmetics that make your fucking character look like some little fucking anime thing. And then people will be happy and then they'll cosplay, they'll go to conventions and spread their germs with one another, dressing up as weird different characters. But all the while, it's like, dude, ah, look at what... Mm. And the saddest part of it all is that Activision blue ball balled us so bad a couple years ago because they're like, huh, they seem to like these remakes. Huh. You guys want to crash Bandicoot 4? And people are like, fuck yeah. They're like, okay, let's remake Spyro. Let's remake Tony Hawk. Let's do it all. And they're like, and the, everyone's reception to these games was like, fuck yes, bring back games like this again. And they're like, hmm, seems like we only sold millions of copies of each of these games. We should probably invest more in Call of Duty. Like, God damn it, dude. It just, I don't know, it just breaks my heart. I, I have to rant about this because I feel like, you, you know, like that stereotype that in most cases, probably not true, but you know, the internet exists and everything's a, a, a fucking cartoon on the internet. There's like archetype of like the, the like a conservative white American who's just like, I don't see, or I don't see myself in my country's reflection anymore. Where are, you know, good old white boys who love Jesus and guns and shit like that. I feel like the video game caricaturization of that caricaturization of Americans. Where I'm just like, where the hell are my fucking licensed movie games of back in the day where you could play Shrek 2 and it was just trying to do a three player, one player Sonic Heroes knockoff, whatever the fuck they were doing with Shrek 2, the video game. If you know, you know what I'm talking about. Like, I'm constantly just yearning for games to just be stupid and goofy again, man. Like, I, God damn it, man. 
Like, I'm, I'm patting myself on the back because I finally finished Far Cry 6. And one of my biggest criticisms of that game is the game made me feel like horseshit after I finished the campaign. Because the credits rolled and it was like, don't stop playing, here are 7,000 other things you need to do, dumbass. And then I get an actual email on my actual real-life phone while I'm at my actual real-life day job. I get an actual email from Ubisoft that's like, hey, stupid, stupid bastard. I can't say the... See what I almost said. S stupid little loser. Why don't you jump back into Yara and kill all these, uh, whatever they're called. Uh, they're called a Gira, oh, so it's Giras or something like that. And I'm like, fuck, man. Like, can you just leave me alone? I gave you 30 plus hours of my life playing Far Cry 6 over the past two or three months. Can you not just leave me alone? But, uh, no, it's, it's all good, man. Microsoft will soon buy Activision. And then, uh, I understand the hypocrisy in it. Listen, a lot of you guys like Diablo. That's awesome. I'm happy for you. I actually enjoy Diablo. I think it's a fun game. I don't think it's phenomenal, but I think it's a decent time. I love Call of Duty, so clearly I'm part of the problem because, you know, Call of Duty is the thing that really tipped this kind of Activision over the edge and made them the way they are today. So don't get me wrong. I know I I, I play a part in this, but like, fuck, man. Can, I, can we just have fun again with a video game? Maybe Halo Infinite wouldn't have launched in such a fucked state if they were like, we are going to make another Halo game and it is going to be Halo. The campaign is going to be linear, it's going to be 12 missions, and it's going to be specific. It's not going to be open world, we're not going to promise 25 years of support, and the multiplayer is just going to be classic Halo multiplayer. Well, I mean, the multiplayer is, the multiplayer is within the spirit of classic Halo. But, like, I don't know, maybe they could have gotten more out of Halo Infinite if they spent more time making Halo and less time trying to reimagine how you can make Halo fit into all the boxes of what a modern game needs to be with its stupid loot grind system that sucks with all of its gear that's not fun at all to unlock and doesn't even look good on your character, its mission, its season passes, its extended content, all that stuff. All the while, I'm just like, dude, Halo 3 was fun, and that game launched content complete in 2007. Breaking Benjamin was on the fucking radio back then. Bungie didn't give any excuses. <laughs> I like 343. But uh, anyway, I, I need to pull myself away from this because I'm so far removed from what's actually happening here. But it just it just boils my fucking blood, man. It's it, it hurts to see. All right. Next, let's uh, let's let's move on. This this next one's like technically a big one, but I don't have much to say about it because it's about a Final Fantasy spinoff. But Crisis Core Final Fantasy seven reunion, a modern remaster of the PlayStation P uh, PlayStation Portable, no, the PlayStation P of the PlayStation Portable title has been announced. Technically, this was like around the time we were recording last week's news, but it, like things didn't line up. So whatever, we're, we're talking about it now. But um, the new version of the game, which appears to use the same engine as Final Fantasy VII Remake, will come to Xbox and PC and last gen Xbox consoles um, this winter. Square Enix announced on, la or last week. They said, quote, since the original release in 2007, Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII has received wide acclaim for its deep emotional story, the publisher said. The new game enhances the graphics to HD support with 3D models in the game, full voice over and new music arrangements for this epic tale of stri strife and heroism. Uh, enjoy a more beautiful and accessible Crisis Core going way beyond a simple HD remaster. Originally released on the PSP, Crisis Core primarily focused on Zack Fair, a young member of the group of Soldier, who was assigned to look for the missing Soldier Genesis rep spot, whatever. The game's storyline takes the player from the war between the uh, mega corporation Shinra and the people of Wutai to the events of Nibelheim, ending just before the beginning of Final Fantasy VII. And what's notable about this, of course, is that this PlayStation Portable prequel spin-off title, which is coming to Xbox One and Series X this year, will be the perfect setup to Final Fantasy VII Remake, which is not available on the Xbox, seemingly because PlayStation has some contractual agreement with Square Enix to hold that game hostage away from Xbox consoles indefinitely. So I don't mean to be like negative after negative, but um, I mean, this is so lackluster to see. Like this tells you everything you need to know that there is some deal, some relationship between PlayStation and Square Enix to keep Final Fantasy VII Remake away from Xbox. And at this point, what I'm starting to fear is that the deal, the deal entails that Final Fantasy VII Remake cannot come to Xbox until it is completed on PlayStation. So what I mean by that is we know it's like a two or it's supposed to be like a three part, I think, um, game. They said that the next one is supposed to come out like next year or something. So we're waiting like three to four years in between parts of this game. So by the time this game's done, it will have been in a releasing phase for like a decade. 
And so my fear is that they're not going to let this game come to Xbox until all three or four parts of the game or whatever are fully released on PlayStation consoles, at which point they'll probably do a re-release where they put all three parts onto one package and then re-release that for, like, PlayStation 7 and Xbox Series Z, you know, whenever the fuck those consoles come out. And that's, that's my fear is that that's where we're headed. But it's so disappointing to know it's like... So Xbox fans are being skipped out on Final Fantasy VII Remake. They're being skipped out on Final Fantasy XVI. And now they're being given this HD recreation of this PSP game that's a prequel to the game they're not getting later this year. And it's like, listen, if you're a Final Fantasy set fan on Xbox, you're being, sent it, you're being sent mixed messaging, mixed signals. What, what reason do you have to support Final Fantasy on Xbox if you're an Xbox fan and a Final Fantasy fan? Because you're being constantly told... Here, you can have the bullshit fucking Final Fantasy 15 that was kind of divisive, but did really well, whatever. You can have the, what was that one that came out at the beginning of the Xbox One generation? It was also like a remake of a PSP game. It was like Final Fantasy HD Zero or something like that. You can have that. You can have Crisis Core, but you can't have Final Fantasy 7 Remake. You can't have Final Fantasy 16. These Final Fantasy games are like so inherently peak Final Fantasy and so inherently like the most anticipated uh entries in the in these in this franchise and so it's ju it's just this thing of like xbox you cannot properly get people like japanese game players not like japanese people who are gamers but like gamers who like japanese content you cannot properly win this crowd over if you have such a flippant relationship with one of the most important franchises and so i feel like xbox needs to fight for this stuff they need to they need to be working with their partners over at Square Enix to make sure that these kinds of deals can't happen. It's one thing for a game like Final Fantasy VII Remake to be exclusive to PlayStation for a year, you know, which we all thought was the case. But for us to be three years removed, it's I mean, actually I think it's two years removed, from the release of that game and have no word on it coming to Xbox and to add insult to injury, PC finally got it, it's still nothing about Xbox. To be in that situation, man, it, it, it's, it's discouraging. So... I feel like Xbox needs to really work with Square Enix to make sure that this can't happen again. Because, yeah, we're, we're all celebrating last week that finally Persona's coming to Xbox, and that's exciting. But on the other side, it's like, ah, but we're, we don't have proper Final Fantasy support. And so it's like, you're getting one big dog, but you're not getting the other. You're, get, you're winning here, you're losing here. And it's just, you can't be playing like that. Because I know if you're into RPGs, there's still no better place for you uh, if you're into, like, Japanese RPGs, there's still no better place for you than PlayStation because I, I wouldn't worry as a PlayStation fan about whether or not the next Yakuza game, the next Final Fantasy game, the next Persona game, any of these, the next Tales game. I wouldn't worry about any of those games not coming to PlayStation. And the best Xbox has been able to do was get Western exclusivity on consoles um, for Fantasy Star Online 2, which, don't get me wrong, I thought that was a pretty good get, but that that's no Final Fantasy 7 remake. That's definitely no Final Fantasy 16. And so, they're, they're fighting a losing battle by allowing these things to happen. I know it's not necessarily like they're allowing. These deals between Sony and Square Enix are made, you know, behind closed doors, but you can't tell me that Xbox doesn't have strong relationships with a strong relationship with Square Enix and can't maybe influence or or work hard to make sure that this cannot happen again. You know, hey, we cannot have you sign a deal with Sony for this anymore. Here's the deal: if Sony tries to sign exclusivity, whatever they offer, we offer something equivalent to keep it platform agnostic, or to keep it exclusive, maybe only for a year on their platform. Because at the end of the day, Phil Spencer's vision of growing the Xbox for, with Japanese titles and reaching out to the Japanese market and Japanese centric gaming centric players all means nothing. If it's like, ah, we kind of have something from Kojima someday down the road, we can't really even explain if it's a game or not, which is called experience. You know, it's like that. That's uh, that's lackluster compared to yeah, dude. Look at all these awesome big like AAA mega hit Final Fantasy games that only PlayStation gets. But don't worry, you can have the scraps. Here's a here's a little HD port. Like I know personally, if I could have played Final Fantasy VII Remake on my Xbox Series X, I'd be pretty open-minded to finally playing Crisis Core, a game I've never played before. But knowing that I seemingly will never get Final Fantasy VII Remake on my Xbox Series X, I'm promising you right now, I will not play Crisis Core on my Xbox. I simply won't. Because I'm being sent the signal as an Xbox fan don't even bother getting invested in this franchise because we're not going to service you with all the games. 
We're just not going to take care of you. So, okay, I won't show up. I won't play. If that's what you're telling me, I won't play. And so, I don't know, man. It just it, It's like, it's cool that we're getting something. It sucks that we're we're just being sent these uh, mixed signals. But let's move on. Hopefully get some more exciting news. I promise we do have more positive news as we as we progress. So, we'll, we'll keep it going. Next up, VGC reports. And actually, this is probably the most positive and exciting news of the week. And we'll stick with Sega, who we were just lightly mentioning. Sega have announced, and this just happened today as I'm recording this, Sega have announced Hyenas, a new multiplayer shooter for consoles and PC. The game is a long-expected shooter project from developer Creative Assembly. The Total War studio have been working on the shooter for several years and has previously described it in job listings as something radically different from, or in the FPS space. And we've heard about this game on and off over the years. Now, in a live stream this past Wednesday, the studio described the game as multiplayer, multi-team robbery game, which sees five teams of three battle AI and each other to steal loot from vast spaceships with zero G segments. Quote, it's five teams of three set on vast spaceships um, where switches and gadgets and our anti-heroes with the hyenas are these pirates working their way through this pop culture galaxy, shooting clips, jacking ships, and robbing rich pricks. I hate that fucking rhyme. That sucks. That's not funny. That was said by Charlie Buescher, previous lead designer on Red Dead Redemption Online, who was working on the game. She said the game's story sees Earth's rich inhabitants leave for Mars, destroying Earth in the process and leaving those who remain in a floating, floating orbital slum. The rich invest plunder ships back to Earth to collect the pop culture treasures they miss and sell to their customers. That's a fun concept, I think, for a multiplayer game. I, I don't know. It's 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 cute as like background lore. The hyena's job is to attack these ships and rob them of their merch, battling AI-controlled security forces and other real players to get vaults of merch. Bushire said that uh, Creative Assembly has been keen on creating the game that doesn't take itself too seriously with a graphic novel style art style rather than a dark and gloomy loom look of many other post-apocalypse shooters. And ex as expected from previous teases, the game is full of pop culture references, including not just Sega franchises like Sonic, but also Fall Guys and League of Legends. In the game, the players' will, characters will be detailed in the future. Creative Assembly said that it did indicate that they would fall into certain play styles categories, such as stealth, hackers, offense, you know, hero shooters. Hyena is scheduled to release on Xbox, Xbox One, Series, Series X, whatever, and PC in 2023. And it will not be a free-to-play game, but players can sign up now for an alpha online. All right, I, I gotta be honest. This is a game that, on paper, should definitely not excite me at all. But I am cautiously uh, looking forward to this game. I'm not. I'm. I'll, I'll be honest. Yes, it has a little bit of Overwatch. It has a little bit of Borderlands in it. That kind of makes me feel like this is artistically a little redundant and uncreative and just bandwagon-like. But I think there's enough at play here where it's it's different. And yeah, maybe it comes off a little gimmicky in the final product. We won't know until we get there. But I think it sounds kind of fun uh, from what we saw in the trailer. The trailer doesn't show gameplay properly. It's just more like the characters and shit like that, you know, CG, whatever. But I, I'm, I'm interested in this game. I particularly like the idea of it being like PvPVE or, you know, having that like AI plus other players. So it can be hopefully played a little more casual and fun and frantic, kind of like how Titanfall was played which is something I think sorely misses because multiplayer games are taking themselves way too seriously and being way too sweaty more and more these days. So that aspect has me quite interested. And then the idea that like sometimes depending on what happens in the in the match, you can go into a zero G mode and everything just gets like fucking wonky and the physics change. I think that sounds like it can add a lot of chaos and comedy to the game and make it a lot of fun. And I actually do kind of dig the art style because yes, while it is that kind of obnoxious Cal arts, silly, goofy, no, not CalArts. CalArts is more like like uh, like Cartoon Network TV cartoons. That typical games industry, like Borderlands, like here's a badass chick with a pink mohawk and a dude that just doesn't take shit from nobody and for some reason looks like a cowboy even though he's got a robotic arm. It's like, it's like a lot of that kind of art style. However, it hits it with like a lower frame rate kind of like 24 frame animation kind of kind of look to it. it has almost like that spider-man into the spider-verse movie it has a little bit of that going with it so that like comic book low frame rate kind of animation i think is really cool um i'm curious to see what that game looks like in action with that or maybe that was just the video kind of teasing it that way i don't know but i i'm into the idea of this shooter game where there are multiple approaches to how you play it and it can be kind of comedic and ridiculous and wacky um, but you can also kind of take it serious and there is an objective to it. And I also just think it's a cool premise to be like, all the rich people went to Mars, Earth is destroyed, 
and all of, like the poor people and the normie people are just like adrift on these like <laughs> various shards and planets and things just out there in orbit and they're just trying to like steal from the rich and, and sell it and basically pirate shit i think that's a fun concept especially for a wacky zany multiplayer game that of course is going to have to be supported through probably seasons of gameplay and whatnot now the other thing i had to say about this is i think part of why i'm being a little soft on it is because this game is developed by creative assembly and that's a developer i just have a lot of respect and appreciation for for those who don't know creative assembly of course are you know in xbox world are most famous because in 2017 they were the halo wars 2 developers Halo Wars 2, a phenomenal game. They're also really famous for the Total War series, as well as uh, a lot of the Warhammer uh, games. Total War Warhammer, as well as the classic Total War series. Well, I don't know, whatever. They also worked on Alien Isolation, or they made Alien Isolation, which is their only other like first-person game they've ever made. And that's that's kind of where I'm like just a little disappointed because it's like I get it, okay? These RTS games are just not mainstream in today's world, and in a world where you can't have a big publisher putting out these little small games for the most part, everything's got to be big budget, triple A, big big grab. You gotta you gotta go with where the trend is. So for them to make this kind of hero shooter multiplayer centric game, I get it, I understand it. But it just makes me sad to see Creative Assembly, one of the premier RTS developers, stepping away from RTS. And that just, uh, it's a little disappointing, right? You hope to see them come back to it. You hope that this is just, a, a, um, you know, a, a creative, experimental, different project they're doing. But you never know when it could become like Apex Legends, where, you know, we had a respawn. They were working on Titanfall. They were so good at these single-player FPSs with a great multiplayer suite. And then they hit it out of the park with a really excellent, really popular Battle Royale. And now Respawn is stuck on on Battle Royale and Star Wars. And it's like, fuck, you know? And I don't want to see that be the case where, like, this game comes out and it's a huge success. And then it's like, by Creative Assembly, they'll never make an RTS again. But at the same time, this game is launching into a market that's very competitive for these types of games. And a lot of these games just get eaten up and forgotten. And so it's pretty possible also that this game comes and goes without much of a whisper. And for them to have the balls to be like, this is not free to play. This is a full game. It costs 60 bucks or whatever. And you have to buy the full fucking package. For me, I'm like, respect. I like that. I appreciate that. But, you know, also for a lot of gamers, it can be hard to get a game like this to soar and to take off and find an audience if you paywall it properly, you know? And you hope that this is like, we're going to focus less on microtransactions, less on season pass and see, just buy the game, have fun and move on. I don't know, man, that, that approach doesn't seem to really work anymore. And what we see in games try to do the whole buy the game and then later, later, you know, keep, keep paying for additional content. We, we see those games backtrack and go free to play Overwatch 2, Destiny 2, etc. You know, so it's hard to see how it's going to play out for this game, but I'm, I'm actually cautiously optimistic. This game sounds kind of interesting, and I'm I'm rooting for Creative Assembly. I want to see them do well. I want to see them have a huge hit on their hands, and I want to see them. I don't know. I just I want to see them get some recognition because they're a studio I think highly of, and I uh, I, I want them to experience some love and success. All right, this next one, it's a biggish story. I just don't have too much to say to it, so we'll, we'll see what I can gather. But from GamesIndustry.biz, Electronic Arts boss Andrew Wilson saw a pay drop in 2021 following a vote from shareholders to lower executive bonuses. In a new company filing spotted by Axios, the firm reported that Wilson received $19.9 million in 12 months, ending in March 31st. In the decline, it is a decline of $39.2 million in salary that Wilson was paid the year prior. However, the CEO was still awarded a sizable stock grant of $30 million for the same period. According to proxy filing, the company's board of directors said that the bonus was in the best interest of stockholders given the heightened competition for top executive talent and the need to continue to retain and motivate Mr. Wilson. Last year, EA shareholders voted against a proposal that would seek to take home take home bonuses to increase from executives at the firm, including Wilson. In response, the firm is committed not to not granting the equity awards to named executive officers until the year of, if end of fiscal year 2026, at least. It also notes that the target value of Wilson's equity award in 2022 was 40% lower than it was in 21, and that was not increased for 2023 either. So again, I, I am not in the know savvy enough about these kinds of things. This this kind of falls into like that Activision lawsuit thing where it's like, mm, I'm, this is out of my my wheelhouse, my understanding. But I will try to, I will try to understand, I'll try to glean a little bit from this. So we know that C, um, 
Bobby Kotick over at Activision, who's basically Andrew Wilson's Activision counterpart, um, had a similar situation where his pay was kind of pushed back by shareholders where they're like, no, 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 don't, don't give him that. But now we're seeing a similar thing happen with Wilson where the focus is on give him stocks, give him shares, not give him money. And you got to wonder what comes into that. Why the shift? We know that right now in the elite rich class, the only thing that matters in the world is stock prices, stock prices, stock prices. And so I think the big thing for them is to try and retain that talent. And so they're, they're trying to get people like Andrew Wilson more invested in the company and not just by being like, Hey, here's gobs of money. You stupid, already uh, egregiously rich man. They're trying to say like, Hey, here's a, a more serious vested interest. Here's something that keeps you tied to the, the company a little more. Here is so much in, um, in stock grants so that you become more vested in the company and you become, you have more at stake with the success and failure of this, of this company in, in, in hopes that they'll kick it up. They'll bring the company to the next level. Especially when you when you look at the kind of year that Electronic Arts has had in terms of money, they've been in good shape because of things like Apex Legends and FIFA and and, and Madden. But in terms of like the respect of the of the games industry and pleasing people with their core franchises like Battlefield and things like that, the company's been on shaky grounds for quite a while at this point. So you got to wonder if shareholders are seeing that and worrying that maybe you know while they had their bread and butter of of the sports titles and the Apex Legends. If maybe they're worried about the longevity of the company because they haven't been able to properly fire on all cil cylinders by getting all aspects of their business to be kind of on their A game. And maybe this this idea to be like, hey, here's less money, but here's more of a vested interest in the company itself might kick these CEOs into high gear and be like, okay, what needs to be done to make sure that all corners of our business are firing on all cylinders? And my guess is that's the idea because the industry is becoming super competitive right now with people being offered insane amounts of money to leave these companies. And that might be the other part is you want to make sure Andrew Wilson doesn't have any opportunity of going anywhere else other than Activision or anywhere else other than EA. So if you're shareholders, you might be looking for ways again to keep him further vested, to keep him further entangled and tied to EA so that there is little that could pull him away from operating this company. In a way, it kind of, to me, reads as like, they're pleased with his performance and pleased with him at the helm of the company and want to find a way to kind of lock him in and tie him down. Um, so that's that's kind of how I look at this, but I don't have much more else to add to it because I'm just, listen, man, I know like where's a good place to get to get cupcakes at Disney World and I know that I miss Sonic uh, Unleashed. So like, what, what do you want from me? I can't, I can't analyze this. Next up, let's talk about Mortal Kombat. I know you guys, were, I, not you guys, but I know in general, it's a very, very popular game, very popular on Xbox. So... Probably a lot of you are pretty into this series. VGC reports that act, the actor behind Mortal Kombat, Johnny Cage, appears to have teased a new recording material for a fighting game in the series. On Monday, Andrew Bowen, who portrayed Cage in Mortal Kombat 10 and 11, tweeted a video of himself at the Warner Bros. studio lot. To the background music that sounds suspiciously more like Mortal Kombat 2's opening theme, the video's audio says every deadly technique it salvaged it's sa Savage Combat. Mortal Kombat video uh, game franchise was launched in 92 and has sold 73 million units as of 2021, according to WB Games, including 12 million copies of the latest entry, 2019's Mortal Kombat 11. The series is extraordinarily popular, and it's likely the next game coming from Nether developer NetherRealm Studios, who generally flip between their Injustice series and Mortal Kombat. Journalist Jeff Grubb claimed in late Aug last August that NetherRealm was working on Mortal Kombat 12, suggesting the studio was prioritizing it over its DC superhero series Injustice due to uncertainty over its future with parent company WB Games. So that's really interesting because rewind back to like a year ago when the rumor was that WB Games might be shopping itself looking to sell uh, either aspects of its business or all of its gaming business and there was the whole thing of like well Xbox should buy WB Xbox should buy DC license or this or that and so it looks like they you know judging by Jeff Grubb who has a pretty good track record and you know this 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 leak seemingly that they've opted to skip because i think injustice 2 was the last one so rather than do injustice 3 in between mortal Kombat 11 and 12 it looks like they're just going to mortal Kombat 12 which is crazy because injustice does really really well as also but i guess they want to play it safe and use their original ip with, with the uncertainty of kind of where things were headed with the various wb licenses especially considering that their only other dc games have been stuck in development hell for like a million years which with uh kill the justice league and arkham knights so 
I, I don't know if that's the case, but also I think Mortal Kombat is one of those rare examples of a franchise that doesn't really need to be tied to another pre-existing IP outside of pop culture, outside of video game pop culture, because it's just so ingrained in the fabric of video games what with it kind of being the reason for the formation of the esrb and just such a hugely important game back in the genesis snes days all the way up to now remaining relevant and remaining popular spawning two separate video uh, or uh, movie franchises and just after everything it's done it just seems like mortal kombat is an easier one to continue to invest in and it also just has them rely on less ip so it's a little safer to continue to use and I, I guess that's where this is coming from, but it looks like, you know, unless unless um, NetherRealm is somehow simultaneously working on Injustice 3 and Mortal Kombat 12, it looks like Mortal Kombat 12 is the next thing we're getting, and I, I guess I guess that's how it's going to go. Um, I wonder if we will, where that puts Injustice, because that, that franchise is so well-liked. Uh, you got to think that they want to come back to it at the end of the day, but we'll have to wait and see. And then, guys, as a wrap-up, we got... Uh, from Xbox Wire, the list of new Game Pass titles coming in the month of June. By the time you're listening to this, all these games are already on Game Pass, and uh, but we'll go through them anyway right now. Shadowrun Trilogy is on Cloud and Console on June 21st. Also on June 21st, Total War Three Kingdoms comes to PC. Hey, Creative Assembly, see you. On June 23rd, we're getting FIFA 22 on console and PC through EA Play, as well as Naraka Bladepoint Cloud Console and PC. Remember, that was shown at the Xbox Bethesda Showcase. It's that 60-player Chinese-developed Battle Royale game where you play as, like, you play with, like, fucking swords and shit. It looks awesome. I definitely want to give that game a go when I get back from my trip, so that's definitely on the docket. And then in case you missed it, also this past week, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge came to cloud console and PC. It's available now. I know a lot of you guys are really enjoying that game. I've heard a lot of good things about it. I also definitely plan on getting to this game. I really do want to give it a go. I'm just working on a couple other indie 2D platformer games or brawler side-scrolling games, so... I have a couple other things holding my attention in that department. And then lastly, uh, uh, we're losing a couple of games on June 30th. So FIFA 20 will leave EA Play on cloud and console because we're getting FIFA 22. Jurassic World Evolution leaves console and cloud, which is interesting timing with the movie having just released. Last stop, cloud console and PC will be gone and MotoGP 20 is leaving cloud console and PC. And guys, that's going to do for all of our major news of the week. Now let's wa let's let's wrap up, which stands for wet ass pussy, uh, or wrap up, which is what I meant to say. With the important enough news, these are stories important enough to make the podcast, but not quite important enough to warrant their own discussions. Of which we have about four. So real quick, VGC reports that Microsoft have acknowledged a shortage of Xbox controllers after many major retailers retailers have sold out. Apparently, this is especially difficult across Europe. So a lot of people are like, damn hoard these xbox controllers go to your xbox design lab create your dream controller and hold on to it because they're getting hard to find i don't think this is going to be a huge huge deal but it is notable that they're they're starting to experience a shortage with components to make xbox controllers so i mean if you're thinking about buying another one or your primary controllers are really worn down now might be a good time to just buy a backup you know just in case it becomes difficult down the road when you're ready to buy one but i i don't think the sky is falling with this one i think people kind of this was a little a little overreacted upon when this news broke, but notable nonetheless. Um, also, Windows Central relayed that during the 10th anniversary live stream last week the, of the original Dragon's Dogma, Capcom revealed that Dragon's Dogma 2 is officially in development, and we heard leaks about this leading up to E3 or whatever you want to call it. Um, so this is all confirmed now. Details are scarce at the moment, but Capcom shared that Dragon's Dogma 2 is being developed using the proprietary Resident Evil engine, which they're seemingly using for all their games going forward. Uh, they did not announce platforms for the game, but giving the other two aforementioned upcoming titles or current gen exclusives, it's standard reason that Dragon's Dogma 2 will probably be on Series X and S and PC. Next up, Overwatch 2 news. We got VGC reporting that Blizzard has revealed details about Overwatch 2's seasonal structure and confirmed that unlike the original game, the sequel will not include loot boxes. They'll do battle passes because... That's how you do games. And then finally, Skull and Bones update. VGC reports Ubisoft's much delayed pirate game Skull and Bones has been raided yet again, adding further credence to a possible near future release. As spotted by Reddit, Reddit, a Reddit user, the Ubisoft Singapore title has now been raided in Brazil, following similar ratings in, La in South Korea the other month. However, unlike previous ratings, which only covered PC, the Brazilian board has approved a Stadia, PlayStation 5, and Xbox Series X and S version of the game for Skull and Bones. So, platforms are a little out of wonk, but 
Seems like this is happening. I think this is going to be like a surprise launch later in the summer or early fall when Ubisoft finally does their their games event that they've been teasing for later in the year. So that's where I expect we're going to hear everything about this. I think it's either coming out this fall or next spring, but we'll see. Now, guys, that's going to do for all the news this week. A little bit of a short news week. Um, th this is kind of commonplace for that post E3, post Summer Game Fest, Xbox Showcase time period where it's like, we kind of chill out, get a couple new game releases, and the industry takes a deep breath before we get into Gamescom territory in August. So things are probably going to be a little bit chill for a week or two. Um, but, you know, enjoy it. Play some games. Play that new Shredder's Revenge. Play that Naraka game. That game looks pretty good. Just chill out, dude. Maybe uh, maybe smoke your vape pen and, and listen to a podcast from none other than none other than maybe Car Talk. They're a pretty popular podcast. I don't know. There are other shows out there. God damn it. I'm trying. Uh, but guys, thank you so much for listening. With that, we're going to wrap up this episode with the comments, the shout outs from YouTube. You know how it works. You head on over to YouTube.com. Look up the Xbox on podcast. Click on the show. Click on the latest episode of the show and leave a comment. You can say something nice like Jesse. I, I appreciate the brevity of the past two weeks of the podcast. It's helped me get through the show easier. Keep up the good work and maybe try to keep pacing in mind a little more going forward. Or you can leave a bad comment and be like, Jesse, you selfish bitch. Traffic where I live is so bad. It takes me two hours to get to work every day. And your podcast has gotten shorter the past few weeks, which means I listen to your podcast and then I sit in silence for 37 minutes on the rest of my commute to work. If you do not make longer podcasts, I will make your neck longer by ripping it from your torso. And I will say... Ouch, owie, that's scary, and I'll read the, the, the comment on the episode anyway because we're getting fewer and fewer comments. It's making me, it's making me feel like I got nothing to read, so we're gonna have, we're scraping the bottom of the barrel. So, so so starting out with Jay Comatose. We got coming on last week's show. He says, so I listened to five straight hours of Xbox On, episodes 157 and 158. Then I bring up Spotify, and what do I see? A bonus episode. Made my, di made my day better, you absolute madman. Jay Comatose, thank you for writing in. Yeah, man, I, I, I was not planning on doing that bonus episode last week on Friday it just happened that I, I felt I felt guilt I felt like I was skimping you guys or like you know like just trying to look for an excuse to get out of doing my job so I, fe I felt very guilty last week so I ended up doing more work than usual because we put out the Monday podcast then I put out a Friday podcast and in between we did a bonus stream so we streamed more often than usual and uh it was it was actually a fun week lots of fun stuff to cover I enjoyed it I enjoyed y'all's company so thank you for that thank you for the support uh, let's talk about the Steam Deck. Mojo writes in and says, well, at least we had one week that dastardly donkey Bobby Kotick not being in the news. And speaking of Blizzard Entertainment, I can't wait till Diablo 4 comes out and I will personally have a fantastic time playing it. I'm going to smile ear to ear and enjoy myself and I'm not going to let Kronky rain on my parade. Before you continue on, Mojo, I want to say, I'm sorry about being a little harsh on Blizzard today. I also think Diablo 4 looks like a very good game. I'm just salt that Activision can't find it within their 8 billion employees to allow one group of people to make a fucking fun, lighthearted, all-ages game. It's all gotta be devils from hell and zombies from hell and all these evil games, you fucking sadists. You guys all need to go to church. Put some put some salt water on your head that's called Mr. What, what is holy water? Is it, just, is it just like water with salt added and then like a rabbi? blesses it or some shit like that like what what is that uh no no disrespect genuine question okay mojo finishes up and says p.s finally got my steam deck i'm loving it so far it takes forever to download games and its battery doesn't last but and plus the weight of it while you're laying down kind of kills your forearms after about 15 minutes or so it's definitely a sit up in use plus i heard buffalo wild wings had its own exclusive mountain dew called legend flavor with a legend cocktail as well okay the legend long island uh iced tea mojo i'm sorry uh i skimmed this and it was like oh look steam deck we're gonna talk about steam deck my bad i guess we're not talking about steam deck we're actually talking about Buffalo Wild Wings and Mountain Dew. All right. I have heard of Legends, which is the new Mountain Dew flavor that is exclusive at Buffalo Wild Wings. I forget the flavor profile, but it looks kind of like grayish. It's kind of gross. I've been meaning to try it, but the problem is I used to love Buffalo Wild Wings. But the last time I went to Buffalo Wild Wing, it was, and this isn't normal for me. This doesn't happen. I'm usually not that guy. I got, a, I got an iron stomach. The last time I went to Buffalo Wild Wing, that thing wrecked me. Like that restaurant, like just like I felt like shit for 24 hours minimum after eating there. And it sucks because I I love I love chicken wings. So I love the idea, the theory of being like, wow, there's this place that sells chicken wings and beer, and they got a new Mountain Dew flavor, and it's exclusive. You gotta go give it a go. Fuck you, beer. I'm getting the Mountain Dew. I'm getting chicken wings. But the problem is, as soon as I want to go and commit to doing that, I'm reminded of how much Buffalo Wild Wings 
hurts. So Mojo, did you try Mountain Dew Legend? Was it good? I gotta go over there and give it a go. Maybe I'll do something safe. You know, maybe I'll go there and like order like a flatbread or something. There's no way they can fuck it up and, and, and make me feel gross after that. And so I can try the Mountain Dew that way. Maybe that's maybe that's how we gotta get this done. But I definitely appreciate you writing in. Yes, for those who don't know, if you live somewhere that has Buffalo Wild Wing, they have an exclusive Mountain Dew Legend flavor, and they can add it into a, a Long Island iced tea cocktail they make as well. I've heard people on the Mountain Dew Discord and Reddit page say that it's quite good, but then again, those fuckers will drink anything with a Mountain Dew label, so take that with a grain of salt. Let's round out with a couple of little miscellaneous comments. Mr. Maug writes in and says, Dang, Jesse, didn't give me enough time to comment on last week's episode. Those Brits really got to you with their cool wagons, didn't they? As a punishment, I'm going to force you to stream on a day that isn't Monday or Wednesday. Fuming emoji. Well, I'm going to be out of town in Atlanta for the next few days, so I sure as hell will not be able to do an, a bonus stream. But I do want to do another bonus stream. It's frustrating, Maug, okay? Because there are days where I stream on the regular Monday and it ends up being frustrating, right? Like the fucking, all the technology's breaking, the stream's crashing, my computer's having issues, everything sucks. And it's like, ah, fuck it. And then everyone leaves and it's like two people. And then there are days where it's like, I'm like, ah, this is going to be a rough stream. Stream's always fucked. Ah, and I'm dreading it. And then we start, it's like 10 people pop in. We're playing zombies. It's fun. We're having a good conversation. Everyone's chatting it up. My PC's like, I'm not going to crash on you. My audio system's like, I'm not going to constantly switch the mic to a different mic. My controller's like, I'm not going to constantly freeze up and switch to the keyboard. And everything's cool. And it's fun. I'm like... Damn, I would love to Twitch stream every day. This is so much fun. But the problem is it's so it's so hit or miss. So sometimes that deters me from extra streams. But you're right. I do need to do more of them. I've been meaning to try to do some on like Saturdays or Sundays. The problem is I've been spending way too much of my weekends lately at theme parks. I'm supposed to be working on YouTube videos again. I'm supposed to be taking my online class. I've been spending way too much time in theme parks on my weekend. So, Mal, if you will physically come to where I live and prevent me from going out on a, on a weekend, maybe I can do a bonus stream and we can all hang out and talk about our feelings. But then again, you guys are busy people with busy lives. Maybe you guys are out at theme parks on Saturday night. Everything about that, Mal? All right. Lastly, EA's King says, you should play Warframe. I played Warframe once, EA's King. I think it's a cool game. It's like a cool game that I will never get into. If we lived in a world where I were still 12 and I had no money, and there were not many free-to-play games on the market, like was the case when I was a kid, I would eat up a game like Warframe. I would become obsessed with it. I would think it's the greatest shit ever. It is a cool game, and I've seen that game evolve over the years, and I think it's really awesome what they've done with it. However, however, the problem is, it's not, I, I'm no longer a young kid, and I have, and my problem is not, I can't find the money to buy a game I want to play. It is, I cannot find the time to play the game I want to play. So why would I add Warframe to the docket when mo this motherfucker loves Destiny 2 and hasn't even gotten around to finishing the the, what, the Witch Queen, Queen campaign because I just have no free time. So the problem is I'd love to, but realistically, no. No chance in hell. I'm looking for more games that are respectful of my time, ask me for eight hours, and then leave me alone. I'm not asking for another game that's like, all right, sign this prenup, say I do, kiss the bride, you're fucking tied in for the rest of your life. Ha ha ha. Your social security goes to this video game now. I, I can't. I can't. EA's King, I cannot. I cannot commit, but I appreciate the recommendation. I hope you have a wonderful week. Also, is your new profile picture Garfield holding a gun with a Master Chief helmet on? Or is that Donkey Kong? I cannot tell. Anyway, that's it for all of our comments this week, guys. For next week, remember, don't be shy. Reply. And that's it. And, and actually, that's it just for the podcast. So we're going to round out the podcast now. We're a little over an hour and a half or at about an hour and a half. A little bit of a shorter episode. But again... It's a shorter news week. It is what it is. I got to go pack, actually, because I, I'm leaving town like tomorrow at 5 a.m., so I got to wake up early. So I'm going to go pack, edit this podcast, get it out there for you guys to enjoy tomorrow. Hopefully you do enjoy it. If you do, please leave a five-star review on iTunes. It helps a ton. If you live in the U.K., I will repeat, if you live in the U.K., two things. Number one, don't be sensitive. I'm not attacking you. I'm not insulting you. I'm just being very, very sarcastic. Please do not get offended. Please do not leave me a poor review because you lack a sense of humor. You pale, pasty, lobster bag dolt. Please. Thank you. And to everyone else in the world who, who doesn't have a, uh, a sensitive skin like the, our UK friends, please remember to leave five-star reviews on iTunes. It helps a bunch. Subscribe on Spotify. Leave reviews wherever you can. Share it with a friend if you think they might enjoy the podcast. But more important than anything, I just want to say thank you for the support. It really does mean a lot. Uh, times are tough in the podcast world. A lot of shows are le losing a lot of listenership right now as more and more people kind of acclimate to normalcy again, go back to their 
day jobs, stop working from home, go out again on weekends, have social lives again. So it's been tough. Every podcast out there is losing listenership. And I, I know a lot of you guys have stuck around. I really appreciate it from those who have. It's uh, it's not a, a small ask to be like, hey, can you just listen to this podcast for like two hours every single fucking week? This stupid, dumbass little kid in Florida is, is begging you to do. Please and thank you. It's It's a huge... It's a huge commitment to be like, hey, I'm going to be a supporter of the show. And um, your time is, is is the most important thing you have. Obviously, none of us are going to live forever. So the fact that you guys choose to waste a certain portion of your life listening to this show means a great deal to me. And you'll never understand how much I really do appreciate you guys. So more than anything, I just want to say, as always, thank you. Um, if you guys ever want to hang out, we are live every Monday night on twitch.tv slash lightning McStream. Like Lightning McQueen, but instead of Queen, he's a streamer like 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 Ninja. Uh, lightning mix stream so be sure to follow us there if you want to hang out we're always playing some stupid shit uh having fun having inappropriate conversations being goofy saying things that might get you canceled i'm really disgusted and tired of that term but i'm saying it for for irony's sake but guys i'll shut up i'll fuck off i'll see my way out you guys have a great week take care play some great video games stay safe hug your loved ones and until next week power your streams oh nope that's for the podcast that's for the stream power your dreams Right.